This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 226 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. This episode is sponsored by Fleece Works and Equisketch. This is Lindsay McCall from Jupiter, Florida. And this is Dale Dedrick from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show, brought to you this week by the United States Para Equestrian Association. And we also have our producer, Glenn, with us tonight. Hi, guys. It's good to talk to you again. I'm so glad to have you guys back. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. Re- Reese and Phillips say hello. They'll be back again next week. But uh, they, they, by the way, they love when you do Para Week because it gives them a week off. So... Ah, uh, uh, good. <laughs> They're always very excited about Para Week. <laughs> well, we thank them for allowing us to be on their show for, for once a week. Oh, I don't think it's a problem at all. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, have a good show, guys. Oh, thanks. thanks. So, Dale, what have you been up to lately? Well, I have a new horse, as I think most people realize. And although we haven't really had him out in public a whole lot yet, uh, his name is Mr. Bachman, and uh, he's quite a change from my usual horse, uh, Bonifacius, or Eric, as I've always called him, um, who's uh, off doing other things at the moment. But the new horse is, is taller, bigger motor, uh, long, bigger gates. Um, and the best news, I think, from my point of view is he loves to do para work. He's just delighted to simply walk and trot in a small circle and do it perfectly. And if you want to repeat it 20 times, he's even happier. So it, <laughs> it's nearly an ideal situation for him. <laughs> so, so for that's our listeners... What I've been up with is, is getting used to the new horse and the new horse getting used to me. Uh, and at this point in the year, uh, the show season in Michigan, believe it or not, is over for the year. Um, our oh. last horse show was in August. Our finals wow. were last weekend. And uh, so there is no horse showing in, in this part of the country other than little schooling shows. And so mm-hmm. we're gearing up now. We leave horses leave for Florida uh, right after Thanksgiving. And I go yeah. down the first week in December. And we start competing well, in Florida. Well, that'll be pretty exciting. <laughs> well, well, I'm it, from Ohio nice originally. Get, I, so. yeah, it, it's nice to get out of the cold weather. I Which is already set in because we've that, already yeah. had frost. <laughs> I remember when it would get cold and those coolers would come out, it was so nice just to get a little bit warmer and head away from Ohio. <laughs> mm-hmm. So for for our listeners, I think we should tell them a little bit about you. Uh, can you kind of explain where you came from and how you became a paradise rider? Well, I'm a... a I, I, I've been a horseback rider my whole life, and I started riding dressage when I came to Michigan all the way back in 1980, and yes, that was a long time ago, uh, with the late Chuck Grant, and uh, actually competed at the Grand Prix level in dressage, but then contracted systemic lupus, which is an inflammatory arthritis, uh, which uh, really pretty much destroyed my hands. Uh, my hips uh, caused me to have several strokes and blew a heart valve twice. Uh, so I had a lot of physical illness uh, and had to retire from my career as an orthopedic surgeon. But as I began to get somewhat healthier, I looked and I got out of a wheelchair and began to walk a little. I realized the one thing I always loved in life was riding. And so I went back to it. And I managed to talk uh, a, a former uh, fellow competitor, Roz Kinsler, into being my trainer. And I asked her one day, uh, I talked to Hope, and uh, Hope said, well, you should try paradressage. And I said, sure. So I told Roz Kinsler, my trainer, I said, let's try paradressage. And she said, great idea, but what is it? And that was about two and a half years ago. And wow. from that, we figured out by doing a lot of reading, a lot of trial and error, and going to a lot of horse shows, uh, we we made it uh, 
to qualifying and, and going to the uh, 2012 Paralympic Games in London. And uh, now with a, a second horse, um, are hoping to uh, see if we can qualify for the weight team. So it, it seems like a fast track in paradressage, but realize that I came from a very strong dressage background back when I was an able-bodied rider. So that sped things along. Well, I think you and I know our listeners will be excited to hear that our co-host is a doctor, an orthopedic surgeon or, or past orthopedic surgeon. And uh, I know we have some great guests ahead of us today. Well, we do. We, we, and I'm looking forward to chatting with both of them because I haven't gotten a chance to see them in person for a while. Uh, and I was with them both in London last year. And just about a year ago, uh, we met up in Washington, D.C. when we had a chance to meet the president and his wife. That had to be pretty exciting. It was. It was also a really fun time for us to all be together as a team and be relaxed because there was no pressure yeah. on us. Of course, we're talking about Missy Ranshausen and Rebecca Hart. And after this commercial from Fleeceworks, we will be speaking with Rebecca Hart. And Rebecca is a Paralympian. She was a Paralympic champion in 2006, 2008, 2009, uh, 2010, and 2012. And um, she was on the Paralympic team in 2008, as well, as well as the 2012 Paralympic team, along with you, Dale. And um, Rebecca has a rare genetic disease called familia spastic paraplegia, and she is a grade two paratissage rider, and she's on a fast track getting a new horse and uh, hoping to make the team of the World Equestrian Games this next year. Fleeceworks manufactures pure Australian merino sheepskin and merino wool saddle pads and accessories. Their pads produce a vital thermal balancing layer to pull excess moisture and heat away from the horse's back, allowing muscles to work at maximum capacity without overheating. Fleeceworks Australian Merino Wool is breathable and hydrophilic, able to hold and store 35% of its own weight in liquid. A longtime staple of the medical field, Australian Merino fibers have no equal when it comes to delivering a temperature-controlled, pressure-absorbing layer. The Fleeceworks philosophy, minimum bulk, maximum performance. And they have a variety of anatomically correct pads incorporating technologies and designs that address the individual needs of every horse and rider. Ask for Fleeceworks saddle pads and accessories by name at your local tack and feed store. Or visit them online at fleeceworks.com. Hey, Rebecca. Thanks for coming on the show today with Dale Diedrich and I. Oh, thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So what are we what have you been up to lately? How are you? I've been doing really well. We've been in a little bit of a rebuilding phase here because I retired Lolu, so he's um we're still riding him and doing some things with him because he uh he was totally a show horse and likes to have a job, but he's just not kind of gearing up for any big internationals. So I've been in the process of finding a new horse and um just working a lot on my own physical kind of well being and um stamina, which has been going really well. And I'm excited. I think I found a horse, so that's very exciting. We're in the final kind of stages there, so hopefully I'll have a an announcement soon. <laughs> and Ooh, um, yeah, I'm kind excited. Of doing local shows. Yeah, me too. I think it could be really cool. Dale going through that too right now, finding a horse. What's that process like for you guys to to really find that exact horse that you need for for the Paralympics or the World Equestrian Games or just for recognized shows? You know, it's it's definitely a process because, you know, there's that added element of having um, a disability that, you know, we're looking for high-performance horses. You know, we can't – we've gone as a time where you can kind of have less than that. You, you have to have the quality movement and kind of that impressive kind of personality that those horses have, but that can be difficult if you've got a dis, uh, disability kind of thrown in the mix there. Some of them can't handle that or they don't understand the different age or the lack of leg. And so it's a little <laughs> bit like dating where you just kind of have to find, you know, the one that's willing to work with you and uh, the one that fits your body because the different body type and their different movements. Um, some mm -hmm. work, like for me personally, um, my spasticity, if I have a horse that has too jarring of a trot, it may be beautiful, but it, 
it constantly puts me into a spasm, which I can't, um, you know, then it kind of locks my body out and I'm not able to ride it. Um, and you have that rideability factor is one of those really main things. They have to mentally be able to work with you. And then you also have to physically be able to work with each other. So it can right. take quite a long time to kind of find the right combination. And, and I, I, I managed to find a horse in the spring that I think is going to work for me. Um, but mm-hmm. I know we looked at a number of different horses. And I think what helped was having a coach who really understands very clearly what I can ride and what I can't ride. Mm-hmm. And I think she was able to help sort out what was worth trying and what was not. Because there were a number of horses she sat on, trotted a lap, and said, no, that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because I have very specific requirements, and I know you do as well, Becca. And I think mm-hmm. we know our own physical limitations, and we know how to work with them. And as you said, it's a matter of finding a horse that will jive with those limitations. It, to me, is important. Uh, the grade two test, the way they're currently written, uh, challenges some horses mentally. That constant stop-start. And there's very a lot true. Very, true. very forward walking. And to a lot of horses, that forward walking is just deadly dull. And it's tricky that to find a true. horse that both has a big motor and bounds into a big trot and then comes right back and walks for two laps. No, very true. So that's a, tests, that's a, you know, and everyone's kind of learning those. That, that's a requirement that's difficult to try and explain to the people when you're looking for a horse that I want one who is really thrilled in a small area, just walking and trotting. And Rebecca, with, you were talking about not only finding your horse, but you've been kind of working on yourself and your well-being. And is fitness involved in that as well? Yeah, I think that is a huge kind of component for that. Just because my disability is progressive, um, I have to stay really on top of it. Because if I kind of let the strength or let the stamina kind of lapse, um, especially when I'm kind of in between horses, when I'm trying new horses, I'm trying other things, I have to be very strong in order to be able to stay with that and be able to handle kind of those new horses and those new situations. And um, I do a lot of core work um, and I work on the kind of the parts of my body that I can control and, and strengthen. Um, so that's a lot of kind of upper body and core. And I found that, you know, in doing so, it's actually improved my riding just because I'm working very dedicatedly kind of with um, uh, my personal trainer and a physical therapist kind of hand in hand. And then also a muscle activator who's been very kind of poignant in getting my body to kind of stay in a state that I can really use it, um, use the, you know, the parts that I still have access to and kind of the nerve connections that are still there. We've been trying to strengthen those so that as it does progress, um, you know, the the outward signs are less visible. And we've been mm-hmm. fairly successful at that. So that's been a very kind of fun last eight months or so where I've been very focused on doing that. And it's really, I think it's come across in the riding. I feel that it's, um, you know, just being able, my balance is better, my strength is better there. And um, I'm looking forward to kind of getting that new partnership and kind of using that added fitness to kind of make that because we're going to have to hit the ground running um in order to qualify for for all the things that we've uh we need to in order to try and make the world equestrian games next year so just to kind of be able to kind of keep that keep the momentum and the stamina through kind of the next i don't know basically the next year i think it's really important to just kind of stay on top of that fitness and that strength Right. That that turns out to be a, a problem for, for many of the para riders. And and there's mm-hmm. a whole group of people like myself for whom uh chronic illness is is largely the cause of our being a para competitor. And and mm-hmm. for us it's not just fitness, but it's managing illness that comes and goes in, in rather awkward patterns. Um and I know mm-hmm. if I get just the littlest bit overly tired, I, I get into heart trouble almost immediately. Um, and, and Donna and I have talked about this at length, Donna Panessa and I, um, because we both struggle. We both have pacemakers, for example. And so our hearts only beat at the rate that the pacemaker is set at. And they will beat a little faster, but not much. And so all mm-hmm. we can really do is control our breathing 
and learn to deal with the oxygen debt that we get um, when we ask our bodies to do more than our hearts really compensate for. So fitness mm-hmm. becomes a, a really important issue. And you guys are both grade twos, which kind of brings to the point of there are very differences in grade twos. And I guess, Rebecca, explain to me grade two in generally. Generally, grade two are kind of your, um, for me, it's basically a, a paraplegia um, where it's muscle wasting and paralysis. When I actually sit on a horse, my legs really don't work, um, which is why just based on the angle that my hip is kind of positioned, I can't really use my leg, um, which is why I have the kind of Velcro strap to basically hold it there. And then I also use that because if my leg, if I don't have it, my, my, my leg just kind of flops around and it, it's confusing for the horse. It's quite painful for me because I actually tore all the ligaments in my knee um, when I didn't mm-hmm. have that strap. Um, oh, wow. And then there's other, um, you know, kind of on the other side of things, there's, you, you know, you have more um, kind of riders that have either um, heart conditions or um, are affected um, mildly in all four limbs or have kind of an overall lack of strength. So it's quite, a, mm-hmm. it's quite actually a wide range in grade two of your kind of um, varying degrees of disability and how they affect you on the horse. And Becca, what is the, I guess either of you can answer my question, but tell me about the test, the grade two test for you guys, what you're really showing in those tests. That is one of the hard things with para. And one thing that people don't fully understand about para equestrian is people often misconstrue that para is referring to that kind of disability or paraplegia kind of aspect. And it actually means parallel. And because we are an FEI sport, you know, we're looking for consistent rhythm, FEI, you know, balance and frame and impulsion and suppleness and carriage while we're doing, even though we're just doing the walk trot. And, you know, those tests are actually quite difficult because as Dale was mentioning earlier, you know, it's very stop-start, it's very abrupt, and you have to ride it very skillfully in order to get it to flow harmoniously, kind of from piece to piece. And then you also, there's a very kind of big lag time with the new test where you're kind of going along, you're going along, and then you have, you walk, and you walk for a very <laughs> long time. And, you know, it's hard to get the horses focused and energetic and enjoying that part of the test because they're kind of like, really, are we still doing this? And you have to just kind of get them to stay with it. And so it's, it's quite difficult to ride, actually. The other thing I think it's hard for people to understand is, as you said, Becca, because it is only walk and trot, what they don't realize is the horse needs to look like at least a fourth-level pre-St. George horse in frame and presentation. And the expectation Mm -hmm. is those big, engaged gates um, with a lot of reach and a lot of suspension, and that is darn hard to do in a small space, and particularly when you just stop and start all the time. So it does take a special Absolutely. horse and a special rider to get that out of the animal. And what is the importance, I guess, of of going and taking these new horses and, and showing off these grade two tests and going to these shows, these recognized shows, and then eventually going to FEI? How important is it that you get yourself out there with these new horses um, with these newer grade two tests? You know, that's an incredibly, yeah, it's absolutely critical because it's, you know, you've got a lot of, it's kind of like the trifecta. It's, it's a new sport. It's a new test. It's a new horse. You have to, you know, you have to, being the new sport, being paraquestrian, you have to get it out there so people understand it and respect it and support it, which is hugely important because without that support, you know, it's hard to keep the, the whole movement and the whole organization kind of going in the right direction. And the only way you can do that is being out there and being visible. And then with a new horse, you just, and new test, it's, you have to learn that horse. You have to learn them in all different kinds of situations. So, because it's never, you know, you're never competing in the ideal quiet situation. There are flags, there are dogs, there are other horses, there, it could rain, it could be sunny, you know, you never know. And different footings, you have to kind of see how they respond in all the situations. So you kind of have a game plan for each individual situation and know how to handle it when it comes up and then with the new test just because they are you know they're stop start and they're new figures and they're new patterns 
Um, you end in a small arena with a different horse. You just have to kind of ride those so you can be so on your game because it's one of those things that you have to consistently be out there, you know, riding right. and scoring very well. Otherwise, you know, if it gets challenging, you might not be able to handle it. So it's very important for, you know, the sport and the horse and for yourself to be out there doing it. So, Becca, where can we see you in the future then? What What's your next step? Well, my next step is um, finalizing a horse, which would be ideal, <laughs> which I'm definitely <laughs> getting antsy and chomping on the bit for that myself. So hopefully that happens in the next um, months here. I'm hoping to be able to come out and be like introducing so-and-so. Um, yes. Once that happens, I am really, I'm going to, it's going to be hit the ground going. Um, and I intend to be down in Wellington um, this winter and then also doing a European tour um, this spring just because it's, you know, it, it's, I need to get out in this country, but I also need to get out there against the European um, riders and judges so that they see this new horse, they see me, they, cause they, and just get that kind of established and get the pair established. I want them to look at us and be like, hmm, where did they come from? And who are they? And let's like, I want them to take notice. And um, the only way to do that is kind of go play in their territory. So that's kind of my, that's my game plan for the next kind of six months or so. And then come back from there, the selection trials and and kind of go from there. Wow. You have a lot ahead of you and I I wish you the best. And I want to thank you for being on the show today with Dale and I and and we, we love hearing from you. So, you know, get on the show anytime you can. <laughs> Feel free to call. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you guys for having me. It was great to come out. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the night. Right after this commercial from Equisketch, we'll be speaking to Missy Ransenhausen. And Missy's been the coach of the uh, U.S. Para team since roughly 2000. And I know she has a lot to tell us. Uh, not only about what the status of the uh, para world is at the moment, but I think she'll give us some insight into matching horses and riders and helping people find some hints on uh, training as well. Glenn the Geek here. The life of horse person is hard enough, and we all hate doing the required paperwork, and unfortunately many of us never get around to it, and it just piles up on our desk. That is about to change thanks to the Equisketch Records app for your iPhone or iPad. My wife and I use it to track our horses, and we absolutely love this thing. Equisketch Records is the most thorough and complete equestrian records app on the market today. We love this app because you can track your farrier work, your dental, your Coggins, medicines, worming, and so much more. And you can get reminders on your device when all of these things are due. You'll never forget a worming or shots or farrier visit again. But it not only tracks your horse, you can also manage your horse shows, including individual events. You can manage riders, including lessons and memberships and so much more. And you can sync it between your iPhone and your iPad, and all of this for the price of a couple of cups of coffee from Starbucks. Search for Equisketch Records in the iOS App Store or go to Equisketch.com. That's E-Q-U-I-S-K-E-T-C-H.com. Equisketch.com. Well, thank you, Missy, for coming on the show today with Dale Diedrich and I. It's great to be here. Always nice to talk to you guys again. And so what have you been doing lately? I'm well, we've had a fairly busy summer. I'm I think this is the first summer in a long time that we've actually had rain, so it's been quite nice to be able to compete the horses, uh, mainly the event horses this summer. So um that's been busy. And then I've got two riders, uh Becca Hart and Margaret McIntosh, that uh, ride with me all the time. So we've actually been uh, searching for new horses for them for WEG next year. So uh, a lot going on there. Well, we heard from Becca with what she's been going through with searching for a new horse. What's, what's it like for you as the trainer searching for a new horse? Well, it's, you know, ideally you want to find one, obviously, that's going to work for them. Um, it, more long term, you know, it, it, especially for Becca because she really has goals to ride um, not only with the disabled riding and, and working towards WEG next year, but she would also like to be able to do some 
able body classes. Um, you know, I think her dream is one day to show at the Grand Prix level. But, um, you know, so she, she needs a horse that's a little bit versatile that way. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that has a, has a great walk. Um, but can still, you know, possibly perform more of the upper level movements. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's that's a hard shoe to fill. But um, we keep searching, and we we've got a couple uh, ones that look quite nice. So hopefully, uh, it will come about soon. And Becca mentioned you guys might be going to Europe this year. How important is it that you you get over there and go to Europe? Well, it's it's very important. You know what? For all of us, um, you know, that want to compete internationally and get out there, um, we need to. You know, that exposure of of always riding with your competitors, your international competitors, has has been very important, and we've seen it throughout all the sports. Um, you know, with uh, with all the equestrian sports that they need to to be there competing against the Europeans in order to be competitive, you know, at the games and at the world games. So, you know, it's unfortunately for us that the money needs to come through, but um, yeah, I, I would love to see the riders in Europe. I think that would be fantastic for them. And you've been, you've been the chef to keep um, for our team for many years now and kind of where have you seen what have you seen the changes that have occurred over the past years well it's been um it's <laughs> it's been a lot um you know i started in 2000 with them um with going to sydney and as we all know it initially started that you would borrow a horse um and mm-hmm. when you got to the competition you had to uh you know it was in a draw that you would, you know, draw the horse that you would ride. So, um, you know, obviously from there it has changed quite a bit now that you have your own horse. Um, And the biggest thing is to really find horses and riders that match. Um, And I think that's still where, you know, everybody would love to ride that beautiful, you know, fancy moving horse, but sometimes that doesn't always work for them you know they need to have a horse that suits uh their their style you know their their own disability in a way that the two of them can work together so i think that's a little bit of where we are still behind you know the europeans have you know luckily to their advantage they they have a lot of choices in horses uh, right, and we have so far over here have been a little bit limited in what we've been able to find. So I think that's where we still struggle a bit is really having the class, um, you know, the class of horse that the riders can ride and be competitive on, and then be out there competing. So you know, the sport has yeah has drastically changed. I mean, when I started, you know, back in 2000, you could easily ride your American quarter horse and, you know, and do so <laughs> well. And, you know, obviously now that's not going to work so well. <laughs> so, yeah, big, big strides, big strides have happened. <laughs> and the same, you know, for the riders Looking. that they need to, they need to grow with the sport. And, and that's been difficult too. That's been a long process, a long, slow process. Of course. Missy, yeah. do you think the riders are getting a better feel for the the kind of horses they need to be mounted on today? Well, I think, well, yes and no. I mean, I, I think there again is I, I think the riders have an idea of what they need to ride, but um, I think what they need to ride and what they can ride is sometimes two different things. Um, and I think a, a lot of, of fighting, finding that out um you know it takes a little bit of trial and error um but no i think we're still i think we're still a little bit behind in that time frame <laughs> i'd like to, i w- i would really truly like to see it advance a little quicker than it has um, i I'm, i know. find that that a number of riders i talk to are truly daunted by the cost of the kind of horse they actually need Oh, absolutely. And I, I think that's been really startling to a number of people, not just yep. the flat-out number of, of expense to purchase it, 
but then the maintenance on these animals oh, is a absolutely. little different than their backyard horse. And yep. and that is a, a piece that we, we need to get out there a little bit more. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you think about the amount of traveling that you do. I mean, the amount of gas that you spend, the amount of money you spend in your entry fees and your vet fees and your farrier fees and your, you know, all your membership fees. How about that one? You know, to join the USDF, to join the FEI. I mean, all of those fees and the USDF, all of that. I mean, it it adds up. It is not, yeah, it it is not a cheap sport. Um, and now that we've, in a way, you know, going under FEI rules is nice, but in a way it makes it so much more expensive and so much more involved. Um, because now, I mean, it's like, I mean, unfortunately you would like to have horses that are a little bit older, that are a little bit cheaper, um, Mm -hmm. you know, that you could give a grandma butte to and go down the center line on. But, you know, under FEI with a clean sport act, you can't. No, you can't. Yeah. You know, you you can't do any of that anymore. And that's that's unfortunate because I think that's where the para riders actually are are hurt. You know, I I think that's where there's, you know, unfortunately, I think um, that knocks out a lot of horses that would actually suit these riders. Missy, the Great Britain team has done quite well and, and you're over in Europe. <laughs> and they're funded a different way than us. Can you kind of explain how they're funded so differently than us and, and why it's, I guess, harder for us a little bit financially? Well, they uh, most of their riders are actually funded by the lottery system. So they are, they are given money um, to help keep their horses um, competitive and to help fund to buy the horses. Now, a little bit that goes with that though too is um, if a rider does not get along with a horse, they will switch riders, um, mm-hmm. which we know over here would be quite difficult. Um, right. You know, in this country. Um, but they, yes, overall they're they're funded. You know, they they want their riders to be successful. So they try in every way possible to make them successful, you know, to help them with as much funding as they can um, so that they can train and and compete and win medals. And that's exactly what they do. So Are the para riders funded the same as the open riders? Well, the para riders, yes, very close, very close, yes. Yes, I mean, they they are all, I mean, you think about how many medals the para riders bring home. Um, mm-hmm. And in, in many ways, they, you know, with Lee and, and Sophie and all their riders, um, you know, they were bringing more medals home than the able body for a while. So it was just mm-hmm. been, you know, actually it was great for them in, in London um, in 2012, because they they all their sports, all of their equestrian sports were so successful, um, you know, and on their home turf, that's that was amazing. Um, but yes, they they are all they are all fairly well funded. Is their structure and, that much different from our structure then that that makes yes. this them yeah. so much more successful? Yes, I mean they they start from the grassroots. I mean they. They have scouts. They they have uh, coaches that work on the on on bringing riders along. So there is always a channel of riders. So mm-hmm. yeah, they they start and it, you know it also helps that they're a little bit smaller country than we are. Um, yes. But yeah, they they start from the grassroots and they keep channeling the riders up the levels. So um, yes, they're they're much more in depth than we are. At least I know for the paras they are. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they they start much younger with with scouts, you know, that go to therapeutic centers um, to look for riders, and then they they bring them in to the program. So that brings me okay. to, to thinking about how how should one of our U.S. riders that's beginning para go from just beginning para to really trying to get to that level of wanting to do FEI competitions. Kind of what would be a, a good structure for that for us in the U.S.? Well, I, I think they, 
one is is finding someone that can train them. You know, that's that's the biggest thing is is really starting with the coaching and and having the lessons and and you know learning to ride the test and learning to ride the horse and learning to be accurate and you know that's that's where they have to start you know and then start Mm -hmm. you know looking for the horses and and having the support system behind them but it's really you know for anyone who wants to start and join the program is to really um you know, spend time on a horse, you know, learn to, Mm -hmm. learn to really ride and, and, um, you know, learn the art of dressage Mm -hmm. and, you know, instead of being led around the arena, I mean, obviously some riders need that and that is, that's fabulous that the horse can, can help them in that respect. But for the ones who want to advance, um, you know, and go on to be a competitive rider, you know, it takes time. It, it certainly takes years to get there. Um, Missy, I, I have a question. Do you do you try and encourage people to look for a para coach, or do you encourage them to look for a dressage coach first and see if that dressage coach can work with their disability? Because I have a lot of people say to me, "I can't find a para coach near me." No, I mean, I I think if you have an able body coach who has the temperament. Uh, you know, and the ability to work with a disabled rider, I, I don't think you need, I don't think you need a para coach. I think an able body coach is just as good. Um, you know, as long as they understand the, the rider's disability, that's, you know, you need a coach that can work with that. Um, you know, and not get frustrated if you can't do anything absolutely correctly. Right, um, right. But I don't, I don't think you need a para rider. I mean, I don't, um, or a para coach. I mean, I think. I mean, it's the same deal. You I mean you didn't? Roz was in the same position I was in. You know, we didn't have. Yeah, any and I, I sort of looked at. I, I looked at Roz, who coaches a lot of adult amateurs, and half of her adult amateurs have a bad back, a bad shoulder. You know, they've mm-hmm. they've got a knee that doesn't work, and half of them have some physical disability that she makes little adaptations for. And right. working with Ellie and I just required more adaptation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you might, you know, you might obviously have to change your thought process for some things in order to to help you learn how to make a straight line or, or, mm-hmm. or a proper 20-meter circle. But it's not, um, no, I don't. I, I, I think a, any good coach can, can help any rider. So, yeah, I don't think you need, need a, a pair of specific coach how do you prepare a rider like becca as the coach as you're getting ready to show well a lot of it is finding where i um, you know how how she works best what what is her time frame with her body to be the strongest and then working mm-hmm. the warm-up um around that um becca does a lot of cross training Um, you know, she goes to the gym and, and she does a lot of physical, um, body work to stay as strong as she can. Um, and then I help her, uh, keep the horse tuned up. Um, but she really spends a lot of time, um, you know, training and, and working on her own as well. Um, but she, you know, when we get ready to show, it's really, having the knowing what where her strengths are so if her if her body works the best within the first 15 minutes of her ride um then that's you know that has to be that time frame that she goes into the arena so it's mm-hmm. it's working out little things like that that make a team successful and and you know that's how Becca and I have have come to understand each other you know it's just <laughs> I help warm up the horse more um, so that she doesn't have to ride as long. And it's, you know, it's little things like that 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 make the difference. Well, thank you, Missy, for coming on the show today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's, you know, once again, it's it's great to catch up and, and hopefully help educate all of those with questions and and make it successful for these para riders as they continue towards a big year next year. I 
would like to let everybody know that the Jonathan Wentz Scholarship Fund is available for any young rider out there that is a United States rider. And um, it is one year since his death. That's kind of an uh, interesting fact. But um, the Jonathan Wentz Scholarship is now available, and it will be a continuing scholarship throughout the next few years. Um, I also want to let people know that the Terra Dressage Symposium will be occurring in Winters, California, this November, and it's November 20th through 23rd, and the facts on kind of what will be occurring in the schedule will be released very soon. And there is also a para driving developing drivers clinic coming up in October, the 9th through the 13th in Shady Oaks, at the Shady Oaks CDE, and it's for new and advanced drivers. And I wish the best of luck to all our para dressage riders out there who have been showing in Texas and Saugerties, and we have a long list of new riders out there that are attempting to make the team for WAG this next year, and and I give them the best of luck. And I'd like to mention uh, uh, thanks to the riders who have helped volunteering at the shows and making the para presence felt even when they couldn't be competing themselves because that's an important part of our sport, that we all see ourselves as giving back to the sport as a whole. The other thing is, I I think if we could just mention for a minute who Jonathan Wentz was and why Jonathan and the scholarship are important. Would you like to talk about that, Lindsay? Yes, sure. Um, The Jonathan Wentz, well, first Jonathan Wentz was, uh, we've talked about him many times before on this show, and he was our Paralympian in 2012 on the team, our highest placing rider. And he is a very strong part of our, our para dressage sport. He went from uh, starting it as a beginner and going all the way to the Paralympics. He was a big supporter of the young riders, and he really wanted to see this sport grow. And it was very important to him by putting himself out there in the media and encouraging young riders and trying to help the sport grow by using all aspects as whatever he could. And when he died a year ago and he passed away, uh, we they set up this fund for, for young riders who would like to become paradressage riders and in the U- United States. So we hope that this small scholarship can help these young riders and help them compete and help fund some of their competition that are coming up and help them grow as a paradressage rider. What uh, age does it go to? Sure. It's uh, 16 to 25. So it's young riders in the United States. You know, Jonathan actually was one of the first para guests that we ever had here on the Horse Radio Network. Um, That's a great fact. Wow. Yeah, yeah he was. And uh, when we were in the lead up to the World Equestrian Games the last time when we were doing the World Equestrian Games radio show, he was one of our guests. And then, uh, and then we met. I think we met Rebecca and had her on after that. So, um, so you're right about about what you just said there. Well, that's terrific. Well, I'm glad there's going to be something done like that in his memory. That's um, yes. that's terrific. Well, I want to thank you, Dale, for coming on the show today. You are a great co-host. Well, thank you. I had a good time. It's always fun to chat. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website at dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search for Dressage Radio Show. Download the Horse Radio Network app for iOS or Android in the App Store and search for Horse Radio Network. And you can learn more about the United States Para Equestrian Association at USPEA.org and, of course, on Facebook. Remember, one man's wrong lead is another man's counter canner. 